Hello everyone, welcome back. We're going to continue with our magic after midnight. Putting a hand to her side, Marcia manages to turn. There is Cindy with her aunt and godmother, Deirdre. Cindy is wearing a gown of sky blue that glows with unearthly magic. It has a diaphanous white train that flutters like a cloud. Above the sweet, high heart neckline, her pale skin and golden hair are like the sun. Deirdre wears a dress of black that seems to have stars woven into the fabric. Above the black, her silver hair is like the moon. Even next to the elves, the two seem celestial. Marcia bites the lip. What a world her children are coming of age in. One where magic is real. Their possibilities seem endless. Seeing Marcia's threesome, Cindy and Deirdre walk over. They're not six feet away. When? Looking at Alicia's dress, Cindy exclaims, You're wearing your old curtains? Her voice is so loud, it rises above the gentle murmur of the crowd. Marcia feels all eyes on Alicia. Her daughter's shoulders slump further. Marcia closes her eyes, and reminds herself that there is a 50-50 chance Cindy didn't mean to be hurtful. That suit and that dress look familiar, Deirdre says. Marcia opens her eyes to Deirdre and looking up at her. She can see how she's looking up and down with a clear expression of disdain on her face. So Deirdre says, a real class never goes out of style. Marcia repeats to her, through gritted teeth. Burn, whispers Joshua. But Marcia notices his eyes are a little too wet after the curtain comment. Deirdre scoffs. Hm, if you say so. Guiding Cindy away, Deirdre says, Cindy, let me introduce you to the prince. The three of them watch them walk off and Alicia gulps. You were right, Mum. They really are vampires. Marcia hears a cough. Her eyes slide to the side. She sees a man she's seen before. His gaze meets hers. And for an instant she has x-ray vision. She can see his fangs behind his lips. She gasps and blinks. And then he's gone. Marcia just sits outside the main reception area, now filled with people dancing. She's in the hallway, open to the back veranda. Behind a pot of plant, on a chair, one of the very nice waitstaff have brought for her. She looks at her watch. It's only 11.50, but she wants to go home. She peers beyond the plant and sees Joshua and Alicia dancing the foxtrot. They look like they're having a grand time. She doesn't want to make them leave. They're doing quite well on the floor. Willie might insist that they learn ballroom dancing, but they're getting a wide berth from all the guests. She supposes that night elves are as skilled as Deirdre's usual hangers-on at sensing riffraff. She feels bile rising to her stomach. Magic doesn't seem to be so much a possibility for her children. So much as another world of privilege they don't belong to. She closes her eyes. No, she made it without money or magic before. She'd been born poor, made it into the middle class with her first husband. Alicia's and Joshua's father. And managed to hang on to that after he died. And then she met her second husband, William, Cindy's father, in a bereavement group. Somehow wound up very wealthy. And then the realms had opened up and a deranged Norse god had destroyed several blocks of Chicago. William, their business and their home had been literally crushed in an instant. She lost her husband. The children lost their father. Money would have been a cold comfort at that time. Still, it would have allowed 
Marcia to take time off to help children recover from the grief. Unfortunately, insurance policies had exemptions for acts of God. She just barely hanging on now, with a mortgage for a destroyed home to pay, her rent, and four mouths to feed. But things will get better. She scrunches her eyes. No, they won't, because she won't be alive. Marcia bites her lip, and after all that magic has done for her, why, oh why has she brought her children here? She round them up, take them home. She looks past Joshua and Alicia for Cindy. In tow with Deirdre, Cindy has been fawned over by the vampire prince, the whole evening. Marcia shakes her head. He's not a vampire prince. He's a night elf. Marcia blinks out at the reception. She sees Deirdre, but where is Cindy? From the veranda, she hears a splash of water and a laugh that is familiar. Marcia goes cold. The pain in her side is suddenly screaming, but she bolts from her chair and moves as quickly as she can out to the dance floor and into the warm night. Down a long flight of steps, she sees Cindy sitting on the edge of a fountain, the dark hair of the prince, a shadow against her neck. It might be the pain in her side or the earlier hallucinations, but Marcia runs to the top of the stairs and Shouts, don't hurt her. The prince raises his head. Cindy turns to Marcia and her jaw drops. Behind Marcia, a masculine voice says, You heard her, Reen. A sneer forming on his handsome features. The prince narrows his eyes at the masculine speaker behind Marcia. She's only sixteen, Marcia gasps, as though that could possibly make any difference. The prince's eyes bolt wide, and he gets up hastily. Without a backward glance at Cindy, he hops off the wall of the fountain, runs up the stairs, and bows to Marcia. Madam, I apologise. I had no idea. To the masculine speaker, he says some words in a strange musical language, and then puts his hand over his mouth, and, turning visibly green, runs away. Marcia has a distinct impression. He might vomit. You ruin everything, Cindy hisses, charging up the stairs. I hate you. And then she runs from the hall. Marcia wants to go after her, but she's suddenly dizzy with pain and her own nausea. The man, the prince, had a dressed size. Teenagers. Clutching her side, Marcia lifts her eyes. It's the same vampire, uh, night elf man she'd seen earlier. He looks all of 28, maybe. She doesn't see fangs this time. She'd been hallucinating. Obviously, she's hallucinating. The years my children were teens. He shakes his head and crosses his arms. Looking after Cindy. The words seem out of place on his youthful face, but Marcia has heard rumours that elves are immortal. She huffs and says what she always says at those times. <sighs> they are four times the hormones of adults. That makes them practically insane. Insane. She shrugs after this. And then catches a breath. That is a very generous interpretation of their situation. He smiles wryly and says, It was the worst century of my life. Marcia blinks at him, thinking of all the fights she'd had this year with Joshua and Cindy and all the times Alicia had gone to her room, her face streaming with tears, all completely unwilling to talk. About anything. 
I have never considered the advantages of a short life, Marcia says. The corners of the man's lips turn up. Bowing slightly, he holds out a hand, palm up. Madam, you seem to require assistance. Marcia takes a step back, her hand fluttering to her throat. His eyes follow her fingers, his gaze intent. And she gasps. She sees the fangs again, frozen in place. She looks down at the vampire's hand. And she sees an ending and peace. And suddenly, that is what she wants. So much. A struggle isn't just with her emotional teenagers. It is dealing with their school. The teachers who aren't helping Joshua deal with the bullies. With Deirdre, who fills Cindy's mind with tales of how depraved the girl is. But only wants Cindy when it is convenient for her own gain. And it is Marcia's responsibilities to her extended family, her continuing battle with insurance agencies, the spectre of a disease looming over like a dark shadow. She wants to take his hand, but instead she draws back. I have to stay with my children, she says. For as long as I can. She feels sick. Her sigh still hurts. But she bolts from the veranda. In the car not fifteen minutes later. A Cindy. Screeches. I lost my show. And that's the end of that episode guys. Thank you for tuning in. And listening to another episode of Magic After Midnight getting interesting isn't it it's a twist by the way very similar to cinderella but very different also many blessings